I'm happy to see so, so many of you here tonight, although it probably means that you're concerned about hate crimes. It is important to find ways to mitigate them. We are here today for a crucial and meaningful conversation. In recent days, our community has unfortunately witnessed a disturbing surge in hate crimes, leaving us all deeply concerned. What is even more uh, difficult is the apparent of lack of decisive action to eradicate these crimes rooted in hate. It seems that there is widespread confusion surrounding this issue, uh, as evidenced by recent encounter with university executives who struggle to acknowledge the, the gravity of calling for genocide of Jews within their uh, bullying and harassment policies, let alone categorizing as, uh, it as a hate crime. In response to this alarming trend, we have organized this event with the intention of shedding light on what uh, constitutes a hate crime and exploring the tools available to us to effectively combat it. I understand that each of you may have pressing questions, and while we may not have all the answers today or sufficient time to cover every inquiry, uh, I encourage you to, to voice your concerns if not here by email, we will do our best to address them. Recognizing that discussions about hate crimes can evoke negative emotions, I want to emphasize that we are here uh, to stand together and support one another. To guide us through the com complexities of hate crimes and their legal implications, we are honored to have with us today David Maidas. In the last year, I learned a lot about David. I've been making a film about him, and I can't wait to share it with everyone. David is a distinguished human rights lawyer. He has um, devoted five decades of his life to numerous cases involving anti-Semitism, playing an important role in crafting legislation and reforms related to hate crimes and pursuing justice for Nazi war criminals. He is the senior legal counsel for B'nai B'rith Canada. He exper his expertise extends to identifying and exposing charitable organizations that sometimes disguise their true intentions behind a facade of legitimacy aiming to spread hate. David's contribution have earned him numerous awards and honorary doctoral degrees from this, a few universities. And he has even uh, was nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize for his work with the Falun Gong and his efforts to expose heinous crimes committed against them. To lead us in this vital conversation, I'm pleased to introduce Leah Ross. Leah, <laughs> Leah is the narrator in the film. Uh, but she's also, um, she, she used to be David's student, a law student, and she volunteered in his office during her free time. She's a sociologist, lawyer, and teacher with rich back, background in sociology and legal practice. She's also responsible for um, drafting um, this um, information about um, the laws. Uh, the laws that are, are related to hate crimes. Leah is committed to education and human rights advocacy, coupled with her diverse ex experiences, uh, makes her an ideal facilitator for today's discussion. So I won't talk anymore because I think we came here to listen to them and I think we will learn a lot from Leah's questions and after the questions you will have the opportunity to ask your own question, and hopefully we'll be able to cover everything. If not, uh, as I said, you can email me your questions, and I will try to see if David will be gracious uh, to, to answer them. Thank you very much. Okay, can you hear me? 
When I was asked to be moderator, I jumped on it right away and I started emailing professors of law across Canada that specialize in this area and I looked up a lot myself. And then um, I created a lot of questions and then people started sending me questions. And that was great because I received questions from my friend Yolanda and even from David Matus and I realized that a lot of our questions overlapped. So if you have questions, bank them in your heads because we might just touch on them because we touch on a lot of uh, scope in these questions. Um, some will be more challenging than others and that's just um, the nature of it. But I'll try to do the most important first. Also, so you're aware, I kind of have a preamble to each question just to lay out some basic information and facts. And with respect to your handout, it has a Charter of Rights and Freedoms in a box on top that's part of the Canadian Constitution, which is a trumping statute. That means any law that's introduced that is contrary to the Charter uh, would be, could be found uh, needing changes, judicial review, etc. Then there's the Criminal Code, which is a federal law, spans all of Canada. After that, on the second page, are provincial statutes, which are civil. And if you're unfamiliar with the distinction between criminal law, where someone could be um, an accused, could be brought to court, and possibly face fine or jail time, that's very different than suing someone for money or other damages, like um, uh, injunctive relief to make them stop doing something or force them to do something. So the civil laws that I included on there are provincial, and one is uh, relevant sections of the Human Rights Code of Manitoba. It's also a trumping statute in Manitoba, so any law that uh, conflicts with it can be uh, brought to court for judicial review and be struck down, or sections of it can be. And underneath that, relevant sections of our Defamation Act. I think they were pulled over from the Hyman Act. Is that okay? Okay, so I'll start with my first question. Just wanted to distinguish between criminal and civil, so you're aware. David made us, I want to discuss the criminal code provisions in section 319 that were introduced over 50 years ago in June of 1970. Our police services in Canada have reported roughly 2,000 hate crimes per year since 2009, and that's risen to over 2,500 in 2020, and it's going up. In light of 50 years of history where they've seldomly been invoked, there have been relatively few prosecutions and convictions compared with other offenses. Some professors I spoke to view them as ineffective and predominantly symbolic as they enshrine equality in the criminal code and send a general message that Canada is tolerant and multicultural. But it sounds almost as though the Canadian government passed a law and then walked away Securing convictions using hate speech laws is difficult. The criminal code allows for many defenses, uh, which are laid out there in your handout. So my question is this, what more can be done to hold people accountable when spewing hate, hate speech against identifiable, vulnerable groups? Should police and prosecutors be better trained? Should the law be amended in some way with respect to defenses? Should legislators shift the emphasis to other areas like human rights legislation, civil laws, or group defamation, or non-legal approaches like education and dialogue? Well, uh, that, that's a large question. And, uh, but uh, the uh, first of all, I'd point out, you talk about the statistics about hate crimes and then you compare it with the number of prosecutions. But uh, in the criminal code, we have uh, the hate speech crimes, genocide, uh, local promotion of hatred, uh, public incitement of hatred, uh, the local promotion of anti-Semitism, which are 318, uh, 319 in the criminal code. But we also have a, a sentencing provision in the criminal code, which uh, increases the sentence of any crime if it's hate motivated. Uh, and the uh, hate crime statistics aren't just the 318, 319 hate speech crimes, there are also the hate motivated crimes. Uh, and, and there's a lot of those. In fact, most of the statistics are that. And uh, there's a lot of uh, prosecutions. And I, I mean, it could be assault, it could be mischief, it could be uh, property damage. Uh, uh, I mean, virtually any crime in the criminal code could be hate motivated and then becomes a part of the hate crime statistics. And of course, I mean, there's if you look at, at the number of 
crimes where hate motivation is part of a sentence, it's a lot bigger, of course, uh, it's substantial. And that works a lot more effectively the, than the hate crimes laws, uh, uh, that, that's true. Now, uh, uh, there are a couple of problems with the specific hate speech laws. Um, the, uh, well, one of them is the defenses. The defenses exist uh, for uh, willful promotion of hatred and, and willful pro pro promotion of anti-Semitism. They don't exist for uh, public uh, uh, the, the public incitement to hatred. So uh, for, for that, the, the defenses are, are not a problem. But uh, there are four defenses. Uh, one of them is truth, one of them is religion, uh, 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 one of them is public interest, and uh, one, of, one of them is something said for the purpose of it's removal. Subsection 3.1. Uh, I, I don't think that uh, public interest in staying something for the purpose of removal are, are problematic as defenses, but truth and religion are problematic. Uh, and, and in my view, uh, they uh, could be and should be removed. The, uh, uh, and with uh, truth, actually, when the, uh, the, uh, these cases went to the Supreme Court of Canada on whether they were in compliance with the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and uh, Justice Dixon, in one of the cases, said that he thought basically the, the truth defense didn't need to be there. He didn't say that about the religious uh, defense. But my own view, it's worth while well, taking those. Again. I'll say it again. Yeah, uh, uh, in one of these cases uh, uh, that went to Supreme Court of Canada, Justice Dixon said that the truth defense could be, it could be removed, and, and in his view, it would still be constitutionally valid, the law. Uh, he did, didn't say that about the religious uh, defense, but uh, in my view, it's worth a try to remove them and, and argue that they're still constitutionally valid. Another problem with those defenses is they require the consent of the Attorney General of the province where the act has occurred. Well, uh, the, I mean, the normal criminal offense, the police prosecute. Uh, That's subsection six. Sorry. The police prosecute, uh, and you don't need the consent of the Attorney General. and. If the, police, if, if the police don't prosecute and you want to prosecute, you can prosecute privately. The, the law allows for a private prosecution. And the prosecutor doesn't have to be the victim. It could be anybody. Uh, and uh, so that makes it a lot easier for the, uh, where there's no consent of the Attorney General required. I, I wouldn't say remove the consent of the Attorney General, but what I think needs to be done is there needs to be guidelines uh, that the Attorneys General across Canada adopt about when and uh, they are and are not giving consent. Because right now you can ask and it's, they say yes or no and it just seems arbitrary, no reasons are given. Uh, but uh, I mean, th those, those are uh, some of the changes uh, I would make. But I should say, I, I mean, I assume what we're interested in here today is not so much how to make the law better, but how to make the law work. Uh, and uh, so uh, what I would say is, uh, I mean, a lot of these um, acts can be characterized in different ways. Uh, they could be characterized as harassment, which is a criminal code offense, or intimidation, which is a criminal code offense, or, or threats, which are a criminal code offense, which don't require the consent of the Attorney General and, uh, and can be done by way of private prosecution. And there have been some cases recently where the police have actually laid what are essentially hate crimes charges <coughs> under those other code provisions rather than going to uh, 318 and 19, which require the consent of the Attorney General. So uh, the, uh, what I would say is uh, you could uh, use the criminal code today in, in a way that doesn't necessarily focus on those particular offenses, which are problematic in terms of working, uh, and, and pick a, and use other offenses which, which uh, don't require consent of the attorney general, don't have these defenses put in which are problematic. But another thing, of course, you can do is just ask the attorney general of Canada or, or the relevant province for consent. I mean, if, if an act happens in Manitoba, you'd ask the attorney general of Manitoba for consent. And it, I mean, to a certain extent, uh, that that's useful uh, because uh, the more these complaints uh, or requests for consent uh, occur, the more sensitized the attorney general becomes and the more likely it is to have a prosecution. Thank you, David. Um, my next question is concerning section 319, subsection 2.1. It should be on your first, oh no, second page, I think. No, first page. 2.1, very bottom, yes. 
is respecting willful promotion of the anti-Semitism. So, David, police, political leaders, and members of the Jewish community have been decrying an alarming rise of anti-Semitism in Canada since October 7th attacks by Hamas militants who killed more than 1,200 people in Israel, including hundreds of civilians, and took roughly 240 people hostages. Videos and messages are now circulating online that accuse Israel of fabricating the violence by Hamas militants during those attacks. My family lost close friends in those attacks. Should Criminal Code Section 319, subsection 2.1 be broadened to include not just a downplay or a denial of the Holocaust, but also things like a downplay of the October 7th attacks in Israel? There's also a growing abundance of conspiracies about Jews controlling the world. Should this Section 319 be broadened to target those conspiracy theories? We heard a lot during COVID and vaccination issues. Um, and they were very concerning um, because they're inaccurate and they lead to mistrust and hatred towards uh, Jewish people and other marginalized groups. Yes, uh, sure, uh, could be broadened, should be broadened. But I would also say uh, that it's not as if we can't do anything with the present laws. Uh, in fact, I, I don't. I just noticed that yesterday. Uh, the police, uh, I mean, there was a report that the police uh, charged a British Columbia man for an anti-Semitic phone call to a healthcare worker, uh, and they didn't charge the, uh, the, the, the British Columbia man under this anti-Semitism provision in the criminal code. They, they charged the uh, BC man with, uh, uh, with indecent communication, harassing communications, and intimidation of a health worker, which are all criminal code offenses. So, uh, and, and there's a whole list of um, professionals or categories of people that uh, the law does not allow you to uh, intimidate. Uh, and, and of course, there's a general prohibition against intimidation and harassment. And uh, it's, it's interesting that the police themselves would do that rather than go to the uh, attorney general for consent. So. I think there are ways of getting at these uh, offenses now without getting caught up in the uh, need to reform the law. Okay, I'd like to discuss something that we, most of us deal with every day, and that is the internet. Uh, anyone not use the internet today? That was rhetorical. Uh, David, hate speech, anti-Semitism, Holocaust denial, racism is rapidly growing online particularly in more extreme communities. And some of these communities have been quite a blind spot for law enforcement. What can and should be done to limit and eradicate hate speech online? Like, is it better police training, prosecution training, legislation? Do we write our MPs? What can we do when we're seeing this? Well, first of all, uh, I, I don't think when you're dealing with the internet, your first recourse should be to the police or to the governments or the courts. It should be the, to the internet providers. Uh, because all the, everybody who's on the internet, even everybody who's on, uh, just using an email, uh, is, is on a platform uh, for which there's a contract with terms of service. Uh, and hate speech, I mean, you could look at the terms of service, and I've looked at all of them, they all, they all violate. He, uh, did. he sent them all to me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and, they, and, and, and these communication, communications all violate the terms of service. And, and uh, if you complain to the companies, I mean, they're, they're not necessarily perfect in dealing with this, but uh, it, it, they do have complaint systems, and they do make assessments, and uh, they're not gonna send anybody to jail, but they can cut somebody off the internet, they can delete the material, and very often they do so. Uh, and uh, so I would say, and, and what's more, if you get it off, off the internet, you get it off the internet worldwide. It's not just in Canada or not just in Manitoba, so it's, if it works, it, it, it's, it's a more effective remedy. And what's more, uh, you mentioned the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, but the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms applies only to governments and parliaments. It doesn't apply to private companies. So uh, they're not subject to constraints of the charter that, that the government is in, in dealing with these problems. Uh, 
so, so that's uh, one thing I, I would say. There used to be something in the Canadian Human Rights Act uh, uh, prohibiting use of the internet for promotion of hatred. So section 13? Yes, yeah, section 13. It was repealed in 2013. Bill C-36. Uh, well, uh, and then the government in 2021 introduced a proposal to basically uh, put th that uh, prohibition in again. Uh, about communication by the internet. Uh, it, it, uh, uh, David Lametti was Minister of Justice at the time, and he said this is important, he'll do it right away, and he's no longer Minister of Justice. Uh, I don't think because of that, but uh, the, uh, the government, it's, it's now uh, two years later, and it's, and it's just gone to first reading, and it, it died on a previous parliament, and uh, it hasn't been reintroduced. Uh, and, and the difference between the old Section 13... It died due to an election, I believe. Yes, that's right. Uh, and the difference between the old Section 13 and the new Section 13 is just kind of the strength of the... the, the they use stronger language about how hateful the message has to be. But that wasn't the problem with the old Section 13. Uh, the problem was it could be actioned by anybody about anything. Uh, and, uh, and, and Too broad. Well, the problem wasn't it was too broad. It was a problem is that there, it was too easy for frivolous litigation to occur. That anybody who didn't like anything could get their target caught up in a complaint system with Canadian Human Rights Commission uh, and, and, and tribunal, and, and uh, just just narrowing the offense doesn't solve that problem. Uh, and and I mean that's one problem both with the uh, old legislation and the new proposal. And but beyond that, the uh, both the old legislation and the new proposal uh, immunize internet companies. Uh, they uh, they go only to the communicator, the person who's posting. But it's it's the internet companies that have the real leverage. I mean, if they take it off, it's gone. Uh, and and. The, 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 that's what you need to have happen. The, uh, the, I mean, for obvious reasons, the government's very reluctant to go after the internet companies, but they've managed, I mean, they tried it in a different area with uh, press. Uh, they got Google to pay $100 million to, uh, as, as a result of some, uh, to, to press that, uh, because of the advertising the press has lost because of the, uh, the internet. Uh, and, and, and Facebook just stopped replicating uh, Canadian press material. But in France and Germany, there's now legislation that, that holds internet companies liable uh, for what's on the internet. And, and frankly, I think we need something like that, just going after the communicator, who could be anywhere in the world and be very hard to find, except if the uh, internet company tells you who they are, uh, is, is, is not that good a solution. All right, well, you just took out one of my questions because I had Bill C-36, which was previously Section 13 of the Canadian Human Rights Act next. But okay, let's go on to the next because I have a plethora and many people here do too. History shows the potential of words to sway the masses and lead towards horrific outcomes. There's truth on one hand, there's propaganda on the other. The Nazis were notorious for using bureaucratic euphemisms, doublespeak, code words, innocuous words and expressions intended to mitigate, mislead, obscure, downplay the gravity, and lessen opposition of their crime of genocide. I won't get into all of them, but I found lists of them and I studied history of the Holocaust at the university. Even the manipulation of language is being used today. We're hearing an expression from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. This political slogan was popularized in the 1960s referring geographically to the area between the Jordan River and Mediterranean Sea. Hamas and Palestinian militant groups have adopted the slogan, which has led critics to argue that the slogan implicitly advocates for the dismantling of Israel, a call to expel Israel from the area by force, or a call for the removal or even genocidal, uh, genocide of the Jewish population in the area. Now recently, the Austrian government moved to ban the phrase from the river to the sea. In addition, the majority of the Dutch parliament and the House of Representatives in Amsterdam, Netherlands, voted in favor of a motion to ban the phrase because Hamas adopted it to call for the destruction of Israel. 
Should Jews and Jewish allies petition and pressure the government of Canada to follow the examples of Austria and the Netherlands to ban the slogan, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, and categorize it as hate speech, since to terrorist groups like Hamas, they wield that phrase, and many do call for the genocide of Jews in that area. Well, uh, first of all, you, you, your question is, should we ask the government of Canada to ban it? But we don't have to deal just with the government of Canada. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the charter applies to the government, but doesn't apply to the private sector. It, it doesn't apply to the internet. Uh, which, like to make it a, a yeah. crime for people. But it also doesn't apply to universities. Uh, the universities are not considered part of government. I mean, they've got legislation. Like to put in the criminal code, not, not to apply to the government itself. I understand, but le any legislation any legislation is subject to the charter. Uh, the, uh, well, it, it, obviously, I, I would assume the government itself wouldn't say it, but, uh, the, but if the government were to ban it, that legislation would be subject to the charter. If the universities were to ban it, if the, in, if the internet providers were to ban it, that would not be subject like to the charter. Like if they banned it by making it in a criminal code, an offense. That would be subject to the charter. Yeah. Uh, but uh, the, uh, and, and uh, so, uh, I, and, and also, you know, I take your point about euphemisms, but the reality with hate speech is, as you mentioned, uh, with the final solution and so on, there is uh, a euphemisms for uh, many euphemisms for hate speech, uh, and and I, I think we should recognize euphemisms. I think we should apply the hate speech law to euphemisms, but I don't think we should legislate euphemism by euphemism because the, what yeah, that does stop euphemisms. Uh, what that does is once you start doing that, it, I mean, there's a legal interpretation principle. You, include one, you exclude another. If, if you start legislating euphemisms, then a euphemism that isn't in the list it may be just as deadly, and, and, and it's not there. Like for the Rwandan genocide, uh, the, uh, uh, there was Bukasera who talked about sending people down the, 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 the Tutsis, uh, down the Barongo uh, River, well, uh, the, a river which was basically, I mean, you'd have to know what he was talking about, but, because it was an unnavigable river. Uh, and, and it's, there's just an endless stream of those. And uh, I, I mean, I think this is an example of hate speech, but th the way to deal with it is to recognize it as such with existing legislation rather than to, or policies rather than to change them. Okay, I have more questions. Do you have time? Okay. Uh, okay. David. Um, Terzin, Theresienstadt, north of Prague. We were both discussing a while ago um, being at a museum, a synagogue in Prague, and in, in the upstairs it had the names of many Holocaust victims, and in the downstairs there was a um, place for uh, children's art and poetry for children who went to Ter Terzin, Theresienstadt, uh, the, the camp, um, one of many, many camps. And I bought a book there, um, it means I have not seen a butterfly around here. So my German isn't great because I lived only in Austria. Um, so many Jewish parents would like to do everything within their power to protect their children and equip them with understanding and proper verbal tools. Now this isn't really a legal question. It's more an opinion question. And we know that words are power, so we want to equip our children with words. What can we do to better protect Jewish children and youth from hate speech? And what can we teach our children about how to respond when encountering hatred? Well, uh, maybe that's a question I should ask you and you should ask me because you're an educator and for, for children and I'm not. Uh, but I remember from my elementary school days <laughs> that I was shown a film that basically just explained the meaning of the word stereotype, which of course as a child I never heard before, but uh, it, it was very uh, revelatory for me uh, because, it, I mean, this is a very, uh, this is a, a, a common problem for bigotry and I see it all the time. Uh, people 
see one member of a group or some members of a group with mm -hmm. which they're not familiar, and if that one member or those members they see do something of which they don't approve, they mm -hmm. blame the whole group. They think everybody in the group's like that. Generalize. Exactly. And, and so uh, I, I think, uh, I mean, that's a very simple lesson uh, that I think uh, children at the youngest ages can learn. Can learn that don't generalize uh, based on identity characteristics. Yeah, a whole group of people don't all share the same habits. So why would we think that? Um, some believe that free, uh, back, in, back into law, some believe that freedom of expression should not be restricted to target hate promotion, but should be restricted as little as possible. They believe a free form of I allows all ideas, including negative ones, to be openly addressed and countered with more compelling arguments. Others believe that the protection of vulnerable groups outweigh the right to expressing hatred that could cause harm. International, internationally different legislative approaches have aimed to balance the right to freedom of expression with the responsibility to protect vulnerable individuals and groups from hate speech. Has Canada reached a balance allowing the right to freedom of, ex freedom of expression while still protecting vulnerable groups from hate speech? And before you answer really quick, uh, it's worth mentioning a lot of people say hate speech, and that's, that's definitely in the United States law, but if you look at our charter section 2B, it's actually freedom of expression, which is a lot wider than speech, because speech is your words that you write or you say, but expression could include hand gestures, pictures, upside down images, or burning of images. So it's a lot wider, uh, our freedom of expression, uh, than in freedom of its speech, which is in the US. Sorry. Well, uh, I, well I, I would say no, that our recent experience with, uh, you know, have we got the right balance? Uh, because uh, what we see is a lot of anti-Semitism and not, not very much being done to deal with it. It's, uh, it's uh, so that the, but it, it isn't just that, because as I mentioned, with universities, you're not dealing with a charter, and, and what they've got is, is academic freedom, which has gone wild, uh, because academic freedom should be freedom to do academic research, should be freedom of teaching, but it's, it's, it's gone way beyond that now, uh, and, and so, so uh, that's a problem. And uh, I, I think when you're dealing, what you're dealing with when you're talking about balancing this is not just an issue between freedom of expression and freedom from incitement to hatred. The human rights system has a wide variety of rights, uh, and very often you're dealing with rights that conflict, that have, I mean, not just these, but other rights, like for instance, in, in criminal trials, uh, you have the right to privacy versus the right to open justice, and, uh, and those often conflict. There, there's lots of different ways in which uh, a variety of rights conflict. And, and what you're looking for in determining where the balance lies is where the greater harm is and where the greater damage is. And uh, the, uh, the right to freedom of expression uh, that you're thwarting, of uh, freedom of expression of anti-Semitism, the, the, the harm to the speaker uh, if that's thwarted, is a lot less uh, than the harm to the uh, victim if it's not thwarted, if the, if the right to freedom of incitement to hatred is not respected. So uh, I think that what we've seen uh, since October 7th, and the, 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 uh, the Hamas attack on, on Israel, is the balance is totally out of kilter. One more question. Well, I just want to look at that second page that looks at a civil law trying to balance a bit of civil and criminal in this. Um, so we have the Human Rights Code, a few sections that are laid out there. And uh, there's also the Defamation Act relevant section there. Can you briefly explain, like, when I taught law at the university and college and in high schools in Manitoba, I taught a lot of the Human Rights Code and I had told my students, you know, you can make a complaint and it's free. The whole purpose is to protect the most vulnerable people, and they tend to be socioeconomically disadvantaged, like homeless people, for example, or people who are impecunious or struggle with many, many issues. So I said, 
You know, it's a free service, and the cues can be held to account. You might not be able to stop them from typing and saying stuff, but you can hit their pocketbook. I mean, if you look at the Garland and Tackleberry case, some boss had to pay his employee 8,500 because her bum was tapped, um, for example. Um, so should we consider taking matters to the Human Rights Commission and getting victims compensated? And, and perpetrators can be forced to take class of, classes under the Human Rights Code and be educated. The uh, Human Rights uh, Act, uh, Manitoba and Canada right now don't deal with incitement behavior. As we talked about earlier, in Canada it did, and then it was repealed, and there's a proposal to reinstate it. And they do allow for compensation, but uh, there are problems in making that system work. One of them, as I mentioned, anybody can complain about anything. And what that does is, uh, in addition to the problem of, uh, in some cases, of harassment of the targets of complaints, there's also the issue of um, the delays. Uh, because uh, when you've got so, uh, so easy access, a lot of people access the system, and it's multi-years before you get a result. You mentioned the De De Defamation Act, which is actually quite interesting. Uh, it's a Manitoba Act, uh, which allows for... Sorry, it's on the bottom of your third page. Uh, uh, which allows for uh, a, a, any member of a group that is targeted to go to court against the uh, perpetrator of the, or, or the speaker that's under, uh, that's raised something that is uh, hate speech and get uh, an injunction against the, the speaker to, pre to prevent the continuation of speech. But it doesn't allow for damages. The only uh, remedy is an injunction, which uh, is potentially useful. Uh, and the act is almost never used. Uh, like, uh, it's the complete opposite to these human rights commissions, which are, are, are flooded with complaints. But the, the defamation, uh, De defamation act system almost never happens. Uh, and uh, the, I think there are ways to, to, to make the, the Human Rights Commission system work, but uh, the, uh, it, it's got to do more with procedure to make it functional. Uh, I mean, one of the problems is duplication of remedies. You can apply to several Human Rights Commissions at the same time, especially on the internet, because it's everywhere. In theory, you can go to every Human Rights Commission in Canada on something on the internet. And some people have done that, uh, and which clogs up the, the system. You've got to have a better system of, uh, of removing frivolous complaints than you do now. Uh, it, it, anyhow, that, that would be, uh, I, I think, worthwhile. But I, as I say, I, I think, I mean, sure, there's ways to make the system better, but it's not as if we have nothing now. And, and I think we, what we should do is, is try to make use of the systems we have in addition to thinking about how old the laws can be reformed. Okay. Should we take it to the audience? Yeah, I think uh, we'll do that. Maybe I'll okay. put the microphone on the side there, and then if someone has a question, should I come to you? And you can take yeah, mine if you want. Okay. You can have this one. Okay. <laughs> That'll have that too. Okay, Any, does anyone have questions? Good evening, uh, Boris Medico. How many questions do you have? Just one or can I ask two? Okay, I'll try one. Good, two is fine. The question that I'm asking right now, again, it's not coming from me, it's from many people I talk to and, and they wondering and uh, I'm bringing out this question. We as Jews are known by few things we do well as doctors and lawyers, right? There's lots of great Jewish lawyers, one of them is sitting right here today. And there is so many things happening right now against Jewish. People and, and as you mentioned, we don't always have to go the human rights way. We can do go the harassment way, the attack way, the assault, and so many things. At the same time, Jewish communities are pretty rich. We have lots of people with lots of money that's willing to donate funds to help communities. And we've seen, I think, about a billion dollars going to Israel today. To protect Jewish people in North America is very important as well. Why don't we see Jewish strong Jewish lawyers organized with Jewish communities taking those funds and suing those people? personally, each and one of them, because when people that spread hate know that there are going to be no consequences to them, they don't mind. And you know what, worst case, they will close my user, I'll open a new one. But when they know they will pay for it, 
And paying not means just actually being uh, you know, accused and being a bit wrong. Just to take a lawyer to defense yourself will cost you tons of money. When you're gonna do that, when you're gonna have 100 or 200 people now in court for this, pay tens or hundreds of thousands from their pocket to protect themselves, and it's gonna be publicized everywhere, each and every Jew hater in this continent will think twice or 10 times before doing something like that. Why don't we do that? Why would don't the lawyers, with the support of communities, organize something like that? Like pro bono? Yeah, no. Uh, the, the answer, uh, unfortunately, is relatively simple. Uh, the, if I were to say something about you that is wrong, that is bad, that is defamatory, that's libelous, uh, then you could sue me, uh, and, and you could get a money judgment. But if I were to say something that's wrong, that's bad, that's libelous, defamatory, about the group to which you belong, you can't sue me and nobody else can. There, there's individual libel, but there's no group libel. There's individual defamation, there's no group de uh, defamation. There's individual slander, there's no group slander. It, except for Manitoba, and the Defamation Act has it, but all you can get is an injunction. You can't get damages. You could take somebody to court for an injunction, and I think more people should do that. I agree with that. Uh, the, uh, it, it's a provision that's not, but it, it exists only in Manitoba. It doesn't exist anywhere else in Canada. Uh, and and it, it's, uh, it, it's an anomaly, but it's, it's something that could be used, and I would say yes, we should use it. Okay, um, I just wanted to, uh, to, to address um, two little things. Uh, one is like creative solutions. I, uh, as a professional photographer, had a client that I worked with uh, being cyberbullied online and the images that were uh, being spread uh, with defamatory comments and stuff like that, um, I wound up uh, using the Millennial Copyright Act going through the DCM CIA uh, takedown notice to have all the images that I shot of this particular model removed from the internet. Um, but other photographers uh, didn't feel compelled to protect her the same way I did. Um, that, was, that was one creative uh, solution to a harassment and bullying situation. And I saw one in the United States recently where uh, somebody trademarked uh, from the river to the sea and uh, pledged to sue anybody that uses it in the United States. Um, just, uh, just your thoughts on those types of creative solutions. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you could get into copyright uh, litigation. Uh, I, my guess is, I, I don't know where that went, I'm not familiar with that litigation, but uh, very often uh, people try to copyright something and, and then they fail because it's considered common usage or it's not copy, not everything is copyrightable. <laughs> uh, but it, it, it may be worth, it may be worth trying. I, it's a lot it, of I can't say, you know, I, I know a lot about copyright law, but, and certainly, uh, but my guess is if you tried to copy that, copyright that phrase, uh, it, you might run into uh, trouble with the Canadian copyright law. There are a lot of exceptions uh, in our Copyright Act. Yes. Um, like education, there's uh, like 20 exceptions. Uh, we've probably all uh, seen scenes from uh, shopping malls across Canada where mobs of Hamas supporters wrapped in kafiyas are harassing shoppers uh, on private property. Uh, I'm wondering if you think, is this is this criminal activity? And if it is, why? <coughs> what are your thoughts on why the authorities are not taking action against this activity? Well, as, as I indicated, there, there is a, uh, an offense, offenses of intimidation and harassment in the criminal code, so they probably could be prosecuted. Uh, the, uh, and, I, why it isn't happening, yet, I suppose it would depend on whether the people go to the police, and if, if they go to the police, whether the police are, are able to are familiar enough with this. I, I mean, uh, Leah, you asked me about education, and, and sometimes what you need is education or training of police forces. Uh, the, uh, the Ottawa police are, I, I would say, on top of the issue, and, and they're uh, imaginative. Uh, the, uh, on the whole, I mean, a lot of the major cities have hate crime teams, uh, and, and Winnipeg has one, 
and uh, I think uh, they need to be uh, told about, and educated about, trained uh, about the ways to use the law in, in order to get at these problems. Uh, the Toronto has happened literally in front of the police, and they did nothing. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, then did I the, would say that that's a bit, but did the, the victims thing is, press uh, charges? Uh, the thing is, if the yeah. police, you know, uh, as I said, these offenses, intimidation, harassment, they're, they're crimes for which there can be private prosecution. If the police did nothing, you could prosecute yourself. I mean, anybody can prosecute uh, for private prosecution offenses. But they don't I know mean, that, maybe they don't know that. Well, I'm, I'm not saying <laughs> that you were wrong to have done nothing up to now, but, uh, but the, the, the reality is we don't have to rely on the police to prosecute. For except where the consent of the attorney general is required, and, and for harassment and intimidation, it's not required. <coughs> so this brings back to my question: If we can, as a community, prosecute somebody who is went against the Jewish people, but not all Jewish people, but first specifically this person in this mall or the store, right? Why, why we don't, as a community, as a Jewish lawyers, pick this issue up and say, okay, police not going after you, we're going to go after you. Okay, but it has to be. There has to be harassment of in, in, in individuals. Uh, there has to be somebody targeted. Uh, I mean, if, if somebody makes a statement against a whole group, uh, th there's there's no one individual that's targeted. It has to be something like in a store. It's it's obvious that the customers are being harassed. Uh, and, and in this, um, the Ottawa police, uh, it was a phone call directed against a particular health worker. If if somebody calls you or uh, on the street or, or sends you an e email uh, and, and sends you a bunch of anti-Semitic diatribes, that could be prosecutable under the criminal code as intimidation or harassment or threats. But if, if somebody just posts a statement on the internet that, that's a, a slander against all Jews, uh, it, it, that's, that's more difficult. Well, we have plenty of those cases Okay, sorry. Well, yeah, I have a question over here. Hi, David. Hi. Over here. Kim. Hi. Oh, okay. Hi, hi. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, my question actually is a bit into the future. Um, uh, my brain is probably going to freeze because I hate public speaking. So just give me a sec. Um, okay, it surrounds artificial intelligence. And I don't have any knowledge of the law but I started searching for the law using um, artificial intelligence search engine, and I got a version of the law, which doesn't sound like the law. So I'm wondering if uh, machines are um, learning to generate output based on the information that they're being fed today. Uh, who is feeding the, like how do we deal with if the law, the evolution of the law, if the law is gonna change um, history is going to change. All the information that's delivered is going to change. Should we be thinking about how to apply the law now, or should we be thinking about, you know, how do we reach the young Jewish um, computer programmers or uh, unite the lawyers with the programmers to prevent, um, you know, uh, a false history? of the Jews or that the Holocaust never existed or anything like that according to machines which are looking like the future, if that makes any sense. Where should we be focusing? Should we be focusing on what we do right now or should we be more concerned with the fact that there might not even be courts in 10 years? It might just be all handled by a machine. So should we be looking at how the machines are being programmed instead of focusing all our energy on? Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, yes. Uh... <laughs> Uh, you ask where the focus should be. Well, I, I, I would say that, I mean, what you're raising is a legitimate area of focus, but it shouldn't be the only focus. I, I mean, I think we should focus on the past, the present, and the future, <laughs> not just on the future. Uh, and, uh, I mean, when you're dealing with artificial intelligence, uh, it, it represents a, a problem uh, uh, which is uh, interface between the law and technology. Uh, and, and that's true basically the, the whole of the internet. I mean, it's not just artificial intelligence, but 
digital platforms, uh, the whole system of the internet. And the reality is, uh, I mean, you've got a huge legal profession and you've got a huge technological world, but the overlap is almost zero. Uh, the, uh, I, I was at, uh, at a conference in Washington, D.C. a couple months ago on the, sponsored by the Inter uh, International Electronic and Electrical Engineering Society. Uh, that organization has half a million members. Uh, it's got 245 chapters. It's ev everywhere in the world. Uh, the, uh, and, and it was specifically focusing on digital platforms and societal harms, uh, hate speech, uh, disinformation, extremism. Uh, and I mean, it, there's half a million members of this, this uh, sponsoring organization, and, and there's a, a wealth of lawyers, a large number of lawyers. There was 50 people at the conference that knew the subject matter, that were able to discuss it, uh, and, and, and I mean, it was just, a, it, it wasn't a, uh, it was kind of an initiating conference, and we'll have more in the future, and, and we'll carry it on, and, and, and it's a big problem but there's very few people focused on it uh, because there's very few people that are, I mean, the, the, the legal profession, uh, I, I confess, is not that into the problems of technology. And, and the technological people are not that interested in legal problems. I mean, they're interested in developing technology. So I, I think uh, what you're raising is an important issue has to be addressed, but it's not the only issue. I mean, we've got other issues to focus on as well. Just on legislation, when I drafted bills and amendments in the Manitoba legislature, um, like we would look at laws that were introduced across Canada, in US, and Australia, New Zealand, Europe, to see what was passed, by whom, what the debates were, what the research was based off. So even introducing bike helmet legislation in Manitoba, we introduced it like countless times and had stacks of research. It still took the province like a decade to pass, pass this very simple act. When I worked there, um, like it, John Gerard must have introduced it like half a dozen times before the NDP passed it uh, as their own unique bill. Um, so yeah, everything goes really slowly in the legislative process and federally as well. And then you have these elections that just all, all the bills that are in route to being receiving royal assent, they all die on the order paper every time there's an election every four years too. So that slows it down further. So uh, yeah, it's. It's concerning because the law is very slow, and yet um, the internet, everything's going very fast. So you you have a credible concern. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Uh, hi, it's uh, Sheldon Brown speaking. Um, I just wanted to ask your opinion. Uh, most recently, um, I've had some really disturbing instances uh, that have really been against myself, both as a person blind, as well as a Jew, uh, a person that sat on many boards and who sits on many boards nationally and locally. Um, I also have to be... Yeah, I'm not sure if you can pull the mic. Oh, you have to do the mic. Okay. Just close. This is uh, Shelton Zam speaking. I, I, uh, I have had a number of personal incidences recently that have occurred to me uh, in, in the last week or two, specifically. And uh, as an example, I somehow appeared on television when I was the MC for the event of the legislature. And uh, people at our condo association, some of them became enraged, enraged to the point where they wrote uh, by email that how could he be at an event like this, um, in, involved in a rally, he's become a little activist. It's a real, it's a real shame, it's awful to light candles at, at the legislature. These were non Jewish people. Um, I've also been completely mistreated by about four individuals specifically. Uh, there are witnesses to this. Uh, one of them was even today coming out of the elevator. I said, my wife was with me, and she said, oh, it's so and so. I said, oh, hi, hi. A Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. I don't talk to people I don't respect. I said, what? And on and on. You people, since you moved in here, you wrecked everything. I'm also the president of the condo association. I've saved them tens of thousands of dollars. We've improved everything. Everyone else is happy. But there's four
more people that are together with a team that are very unhappy, and they unfortunately live on our floor. They say, I act, I act privileged, I, um, I act entitled. The question is, where is the teeth in the law to be able to prosecute direct attacks on individual, as, as an individual, as a Jew, as a, a visible minority with a cane, I also see I'm not a target. What do we do? What do I do? Yeah, I, I think there is something actually. Um, I mentioned uh, that, like, there, there is a, something about, uh, specifically about harassment uh, or intimidation of health workers. Um, the, uh, I think it's uh, section 431. Let, let, let me see if I can find that quickly. Um, I, I played violin at that event, and it was just a vigil. There was no mention of Hamas or terrorism. It was just remembering the victims. I played uh, Hatikva, and then uh, I, we were, I think it was on CTV, yeah. and then we lost some friends because of that. Not friends. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, rather than hold everybody up here, but uh, I think there is something very specific in the criminal code that would deal with your uh, problem, and if you want to come afterwards, I'll, I'll give you the section number, and, uh, and you could maybe ask the police to prosecute under it. Uh, hello, Mr. Um, <clears throat> hello, this is not to um, compare or compra contrast, but uh, I'm thinking uh, uh, of the Ku Klux Klan in the south border here. And uh, if it's my understanding, they were penalized financially at a particular point. They, the Ku Klux Klan as a group, for some of their activities to diminish their activities with um, uh, minorities such as myself and so on. They've been doing that historically. So it is my understanding, I may not have all of the information, you may have some familiarity with it, but in particular they targeted persons of color and otherwise including Jews, including all of the above. Um, is it my understanding from what you're saying, sir, that um, there's no provision in Canada for class action uh, remedies, or is it just has to be on an individual level? Well, as, as I said, with the uh, Defamation Act of Manitoba, you can, simply because you're a member of the group, uh, ask for an injunction to stop the continuation of the, the hate speech but you can't get damages, it, it, it's just an injunction. And it exists only in Manitoba, it doesn't exist in the other provinces. The, uh, there's no common law tort of, uh, of group libel, there's uh, a common law tort of, um, of individual libel. If they breach the injunction, can you get relief for that? Uh, well, uh, for contempt of court, mm -hmm. sure. Uh, uh, but, but contempt of court would not, uh, would not be damages, it would be uh, a, a, yeah. a penalty. Not to, yeah, but, but the money would go to the government or the court. It wouldn't mm -hmm. go to the, uh, the, the person sued. Um, Should we pressure our MLAs to amend Section 19 of the Defamation Act to extend it beyond uh, injunctive relief, seek damages for these things? Sure, I'm in favor. <laughs> we have to make a list of things we want to amend, bring it up to Ben Carr and others. <laughs> But uh, I would say uh, that, uh, I mean, the law isn't being used at all, pretty much. Uh, and uh, before we start uh, talking about uh, damages, let's, let's get, get some injunctions. Mm -hmm. yeah. David? Hi, David. Oh, David, another David. <laughs> yeah. uh, David, I'm wondering, in terms of the coverage of the war that Israel is having with Hamas, early in that campaign, the bombing campaign, there was an allegation that Israel bombed this hospital in Gaza. And all the media jumped on it, um, and they accused Israel. And of course, we later learned, and Israel was the one that proved themselves innocent, that it was a stray bomb that was launched by Hamas that unfortunately landed on the hospital. So 
in this world of disinformation or misinformation, what could you propose or what do you think could happen either in the present or in the future to control how the message is being <coughs> delivered to the world? And I sort of imagine, you know, we all know the United Nations is completely useless when it comes to how they deal with Israel, but something in place of the UN where every country in the world has one or two representatives that are experts on media, and they're trying to control how the information is being delivered in a fair and balanced measure. So I'm wondering if you have any comments or ideas on that front. Well, yes. Um, uh, what I would say is th that the best way to deal with this information is through internet providers. Uh, because, uh, it, uh, or, or, or directly with the media. Because once you get the government, you get into charter, and I mean, this has already been litigated. There was an offense in the criminal code of false news. Uh, and uh, the, uh, what happened was, uh, Ernst Sundle was denying the Holocaust. Uh, Sabina Citron asked the government, uh, asked the Attorney General for consent, to prosecute under the hate crimes, Attorney General refused consent. She then went private prosecution, false news. Uh, and, and the government then took over the prosecution, which they had the right to do, and it went all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada, and the, and, and the, and the Supreme Court of Canada said <coughs> unconstitutional uh, freedom of expression. Uh, it was like five to four or something. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, it was five to four, but <laughs> but, but the wrong five to four. <laughs> uh, so uh, the I, I think it were, I mean the hate speech law survived constitutional challenge, but the the false news didn't. So uh, I, I think if we're going to deal with disinformation, we have to deal now, and that's why I say I mean the, the internet companies they're not subject to the charter and the UN and all that stuff, and they have in their terms of service at least some of them do no disinformation. Uh, and uh, and and they'll take it down, or they'll take down. They won't allow the person to communicate. But in the United States, where a lot of the service providers are based, yeah. there's the Section 230, which actually protects the service provider from being sued or litigated against because of the freedom of information. It originated in 1996 when the internet was just starting, and they wanted to have this free flow of information without having any. Uh, restrictions placed on it, but now with the advancement of the internet, how it's being used for an improper purpose, I think we have to get rid of this section 230. Well, you and I cannot do that <laughs> uh, uh, because it's it's an American law, and, and only the Americans can change it. But uh, I and that's what that does is uh, it prevents somebody from holding uh, a uh, internet company liable if they provide a platform to, for, dis for, for disinformation. But the internet company on its own, if they want to, can prohibit disinformation. Nothing stops them in the law from doing that. And, and some of them do it, and we just need more of them to do it. And of course, what you're dealing with, with internet companies, is, is a business. And, and if it works against their business interests, they will do it. And, uh, and, and there's ways to get them to see it's in their business interests. The Anti-Defamation League didn't like the way Facebook was operating, so they tried to get advertisers not to advertise with Facebook, and advertisers, some of them agreed not to do so, and then uh, Facebook changed its policies. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, uh, and if you can get the internet companies to do it on their own, uh, it does, A, it doesn't run into any of these constitutional, it doesn't run into Section 230, it doesn't run into the American <coughs> Bill of Rights, and, and it's worldwide. Uh, it's, it's not just America. So uh, it, I, I think we need to think a lot more about working with internet companies directly. Yeah. Simple just, question. Yeah. What, what I think is a simple question. Um, as we recall, very recently in the United States, the... Oh, there he is. Oh, yeah. Recently in the United States, the three uh, university presidents were asked uh, at the congressional hearing if uh, advoca advocating genocide against Jews on their campus would constitute uh, uh, um, harassment. My question is, if uh, in, in Canada, if 
Canadian university professors were asked the same question in view of, of section 318 of the criminal code, would they, or, or, or well, I should get back, the, the, the United States professors answered uh, aimlessly and infamously and depending on the context. Uh, in Canada, if university, Canadian university presidents were asked the same questions in view of uh, section 318 of the criminal code, uh, would they be able to to give the, the same answer as the American University presidents? It depends on the uh, context. Well, it, uh, uh, I should say uh, that one of those professors got uh, basically had to quit because of her, her answer that it depended on the context. Although oh, well, she's still a tenured so she's law. She, she's, she's still in the university, but she's no longer the president. Yeah, only one. Yeah, only one. The rest of the yeah uh, but the reason, uh, the reason that happened it didn't have to do with the law. It had to do with the alumni, it had to do with the donors, it had to do with the board of trustees. Uh, uh, the, the law is not your only recourse here. Uh, and, uh, and it's the same with the presidents here. Uh, they care about the donors, they care about the alumni. <laughs> Uh, and and, uh, and, and the, the board of trustees, if faced uh, with a choice between a president who's saying uh, deny, uh, that, that, that concerns about the Holocaust or concerns about genocide are context-based, uh, and, and, and uh, angry donors and angry alumni, uh, they'll, they'll go with the donors and the alumni. Uh, and, and I would say that the, the trouble which, in fact, I would say the university presidents here are more likely to get into trouble with that sort of answer than in, in the United States, because in the United States they have this absolutist free speech tradition, which we do not have here. They do not have, it, uh, well, as you, as you mentioned, they, they do not have hate speech laws there, uh, which we have here. So uh, I would say, I mean, obviously, people can say whatever they want, but uh, if they were to say such a thing here, I would, I would expect even more trouble here than the American Presidents got there. Hi, uh, my name is Ivana, I'm a teacher. And of course, my question is going to be um, related to education. It's um, what we're experiencing here in Winnipeg. It's um, uh, university levels, then it's high school, now it's elementary school, and ups and downs. And, uh, um, that's kind of very important that the other kids gonna have a right education. So this weekend happened something that um, Palestinian Association uh, rented school. We don't know what school, but that's short clip openly in, uh, in the media now. And they teach him that it was called Clip to Palestine. And they use um, symbols and they teach new generation <coughs> that everything belongs to them and the map of Israel was um, it fully uh, colored in a green was as a symbol of Palestine. And we all know how important, and we see the examples in the Gaza, what, how they teach hate. So what is the legal states, how to prevent those kids? We basically dealing with the seeds of new generation of haters and new generation. We all come here in Canada with the idea that everyone is accepted and everyone and we love our peaceful life and we love our um, uh, diversity, right? Those kids not gonna be growing up with such as values. So what should be done? how we can stop it, how that those kids can be, at, we, don't, we can't prevent what they teach at home, but at least they need to know how to behave in public. So what should be done in this? And we do have evidence for the use. They not hiding it. Palestinian Association here in Winnipeg not hiding. They openly, uh, spreading hate, and what what can be done? Well, when you're talking with the schools, I mean, obviously there's people in control of the schools. There's the, the school boards, there's the principals, there's the teachers. 
they should be they doing rented it. school in a weekend but of they rented they it they rented it from somebody uh, and the people who rented uh, it had a choice whether or not to rent it and the uh, they don't get access until, unless they're given access uh, and and uh, e either uh, that access is against policies or it should be against policies it, it shouldn't be happening and, and there's ways to stop it from happening if, if that happened in a school like I teach in schools uh, we're required to teach the Manitoba curriculum that's not in the curriculum that falls outside so a parent could complain to the principals and the school board to the school division and then that teacher would really probably sweat a lot like I don't remember the last so parent complaint I had, but it, it gave me a heart attack. Should we send the email and involve all your superintendents that does happen? If it's a teacher, it might be worth it. Find out what division they work for, meet with them and the principal, and, and say that we're concerned about this. You know, um, my family members were in Israel, and they were driven around at uh, Kibbutz Ba'eri by... Uh, an EMT, Avaya Hertz Roni, and he pulled up his deed to the land that his grandpa had bought that land at that kibbutz, you know, so they are teaching falsehoods, clearly. He's a purchased land. Okay, so my question is, um, first of all, thank you very much for this evening. I have many more questions for you, David, but I have your phone number. <laughs> and uh, also to the lady who just asked a question about the schools. So at Bnei Berit, we uh, get a lot of those complaints, and at Bnei Berit, we are also in a little better position to talk to the school divisions and to the superintendents, and that is what we do. I have a, a case where, a, and that's what I want to ask you about, uh, a young girl, she held a big sign, uh, glory to the martyrs, during a downtown de demonstration. We had her name, I, uh, I put in a complaint to the police about the hate crime uh, speech, and uh, went to the police, and the police, uh, I, I followed up, I said, have you guys done anything? Yeah, but she's just a girl, and you know, um, and they came up with all sorts of excuses. I said, yes, but what she said was very uh, hateful, and she is uh, expressing support for Hamas, for all those martyrs, and for the PFLP, that, uh, that emblem was also on that big sign. So those are two recognized terrorist organizations in Canada. You cannot just let her carry that sign, even if it already happened. I mean, so uh, oh, I'm going to call back this guy. He called me back. It was on the night shift. It was 10 o'clock at night. I thought, okay, good. You know, not now. But we need to educate the police. Uh, yeah, uh, sure. Uh, uh, you know, if a young girl steals, assaults, uh, damages property, uh, the police will do something. The, uh, and, and the fact that she's, I mean, th there are criminal law provisions for, with dealing with youth offenders, but you can't just commit a crime uh, without uh, consequence simply because you're underage. Uh, and uh, being involved in a terrorist organization is a crime. Uh, and uh, they, they need to appreciate that, absolutely. Bill C-36 would have amended the Criminal Use Justice Act as well, I believe. Thank you. Can you use the Sorry, Bill 36, that was died on the order paper, but it's been reintroduced. Yeah, it did have amendments to the Criminal Use Justice sure. Act. Sure. I mean, there, there are, I mean, there's a, a million amendments. But it sounds like you're dealing with a complacent or indifferent or apathetic police officer, and that I would take up with, like, the police to so the thing is also police themselves. When I, this is just one example, because I have, unfortunately, quite a few examples. And if the crime is committed by people from the Muslim minority, sorry, mm -hmm. and if it would be committed by somebody from the white right, um, the reaction is different from the police, I can tell you. Yeah. 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 Well, that's, <laughs> that's another issue. <laughs> Hi. Um, are we supposed to identify ourselves? Sure. Uh, well, you don't have to, but if you wish. <laughs> uh, the surprise isn't that police aren't taking action, that university administrators aren't taking action. The surprise is when they do take action, and I want to refer to something that I talked to you about, David, and I talked to Ruth Ashrafi about it, and I asked Brian Schwartz about the head of the University of Manitoba Nursing 
uh, students union who was suspended. Now, I don't know, there hasn't been any report whether that per appeal has been heard and whether she has been reinstated. She was suspended from the faculty of nursing for a year for posting anti-Semitic Instagram posts. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. Uh, the surprise is that anyone anywhere took action against any student or professor. Now, I don't know if there's a precedent there that we can use. I, I haven't heard Ruth from you. I suppose maybe Ruth can answer me. Maybe. Have you looked into this some more, or is it just, I, I suppose well, it's a private matter, the university would say, but it seems to me that there are, you know, we're all feeling so powerless, and we're victimized, by what's going on, and as Brian Schwartz said, we're two percent of the world's population. Point two. Point one. Is it point two? Yes. Right. Right. Is it so you know we're we're, and we're fighting a losing battle here. Public relations, in the media, um, everyone is so despaired. Okay, maybe Klein, if you want to answer, I just thought that that was so interesting. Has anyone seen? Um, I mean, I don't understand how any student could have been suspended. Uh, first of all, that, uh, as far as I can tell, I mean, it, 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 there is a public record of this. Uh, I, when you did, t uh, I was able to find out that that happened. Uh, and, and yeah, it, it's, it, it shows that it, I, you get a lot of people who don't want to do anything. Uh, and and uh, yet when they do do something, they don't get suffer adverse consequences. Uh, like I, I was referring to this charge yesterday in Ottawa uh, for, uh, by the Ottawa police using these provisions of the criminal code for an anti-Semitic phone call. I mean, uh, th there's no uh, adverse reactions to that. The, uh, so uh, I guess the point that can be made uh, is that these people who are afraid of doing something because they're going to antagonize who knows, uh, whom uh, are, are, are afraid unnecessarily uh, that, that they could take action and they wouldn't suffer adverse consequences. Hi, my name is Jenny Resnik and I'm more of a question as a concerned parent. If the anti-Semitic action was against the minor, can the court proceeding uh, uh, be based in, only on the words of the minor? or they will say it's a hearsay. And the second part is, can the recording be used in court as an evidence? Well, uh, I should say I'm not a criminal lawyer, so I, I'm not necessarily the best person to answer the, those uh, uh, questions. Children are used in family yes, court all the time. Uh, but uh, in, ter in terms of the first question, I sure, children can testify in court. Uh, there has to be an evaluation of their evidence based on the fact that they are children. Um, uh, in terms of recording, I mean, generally the law is you get the best evidence of available. The uh, and the uh, a recording, I it, I guess there would have to be somebody to testify who took the recording and the circumstances under which it was taken, and you'd have to have a trail of evidence to show that the recording wasn't tampered with. But it would strike me that it would be possible. If, uh, if there were certain precautions that were taken. Hi, David. Bill Spivak. Um, I became aware over the internet of um, a demonstration being planned at Polo Park at 1 o'clock uh, on Saturday. And uh, questions occurred like, did they get a permit from the city of Winnipeg to uh, demonstrate? Uh, does um, the Adelaide food, Fairview food give court. Carte blanche to this happening. It's supposed to take place around the elevator. Uh, the food court area. 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 Yeah, well, well, the city of Winnipeg has a uh, parade permit uh, requirement if you're doing a parade, uh, but uh, that would be on city property. I mean, Polo Park is private property. Right. So uh, it's really up to the people who run uh, Polo Park to do what they want to do or don't want to do. Uh, and my guess is. Uh, they, you know, given a, uh, they, they could have banned it. Well, they, uh, it's not a guess. I'm confident they could have banned it if they wanted to. Uh, and it, it, and it may well be that the people showed up without permission. 
uh, that they didn't even ask. You know, it's, it's coming this Saturday. Oh, it's coming up. Yeah. So, uh, uh, so I mean, if it's coming up this Saturday, you don't want it to happen. Talk to the people who run Polo Park. Tell them to, to, to shut it down. Okay, I did have one more question, if that's okay. Okay, very quickly. Um, here is the, um, here's the thing that I've observed, and I'm one of those people that's really good at spotting patterns, so um, I, it should be frightening to everybody. When I see on Facebook in particular, and on X, uh, I see AI-generated images that are meant to draw empathy towards uh, the Palestinian cause, and in each of these uh, images, you find hundreds of, of really offensive, aggressive comments that are anti-Semitic and anti-Zionist. Um, I, I don't think there should be a distinction on those two. But what I don't see is the ability to have the comments aggregated based on how much hate they generate. There seems to be no apparatus to have these images and these comments posted. You have to find the individual hate comments and start reporting them individually. And when there's a thousand comments on an image, uh, that image is circulating. We're seeing surveys being done where people under the age of 24 are almost 80% thinking Israel should be handed over to Hamas. And the question is, how do you get these internet providers and these um, internet companies to be held accountable for the amount of imagery that they share based on the amount of hate that the specific image, which may not qualify as hate speech on its own. How do you get them pulled? Well, uh, the, uh, I would say, uh, first of all, it, it depends on the provider. Uh, Twitter's a problem now, uh, or X, uh, because uh, Elon Musk, uh, he hasn't actually changed the terms of service, but what he's done is basically fired all the content moderators. Uh, which, which has eviscerated the, uh, the application in terms of service. The, uh, and, and I think, uh, I, I mean, you're, you're dealing with some uh, platforms that are more responsible than others. The, uh, with the platforms that are, I, I mean, there is always uh, the economic leverage, which I mentioned before, of, of uh, trying to get uh, ads pulled from the offending platform. But, uh, I also think, as I mentioned earlier, what we need is, is legislation directed to platforms, which of course the platforms resist. And, and it hasn't even been proposed in Canada. We've got a, a bill now about uh, Bill C-36 about uh, hate on the internet, but it, it deals just with communicators, not the platforms. And, and I think we really need to see more that's directed, and I think your point is a good one. We need to see more directed to the platforms. Because the artificial intelligence that's aggravating and creating these images and aggregating these feeds is also learning from the feedback it gets. That's my, that's the big concern that people should help me verify that. Well, artificial intelligence, as, as I indicated earlier, I mean, it represents a whole uh, new field of problems. And the uh, and there's a lot of, I mean, I, mean I, I haven't even really seen this before, that in, in most areas of technological development, the people who are doing the technology really think it's terrific and, and the criticism comes from outside. But with artificial intelligence, the people who are developing it are afraid of what they're doing. Uh, and uh, and, and there, there's talk within the community of shutting it down, uh, which led to, I don't know, there was this whole kerfuffle with uh, chat GBTs and Sam Altman got fired and rehired because the people who were working with him got afraid of what he was doing. Uh, Precipitously, uh, yeah. The, the artificial intelligence is learning from the feedback it's getting from artificial intelligence generating images. Okay, Bradley. Thank you. Okay, Bradley. Bradley. Yeah, I, I Finally, Bradley. Um, but, um, well, I, but have, the, static, have more confidence in our memory. The question about the Gazan hospital, uh -huh. uh, about, with regards to the Gazan hospital that was bombed, uh -huh. um, if I, when I Googled Gazan, the bombing of Gaza, Gazan hospital uh, by, by, well, by Israel, I, I didn't even write down by Israel. I, uh, I got this open letter written by the Na National Council of Canadian Muslims. And it specifically infers that uh, Israel was guilty of a war crime uh, during that time. And it's an active letter that everyone sees. It's signed by multiple Islamic associations. 
Uh, and this is very concerning, and I have brought it up to our federation. I think maybe it's more appropriate to bring it up to B'nai B'rith. Uh, but how do we correct this? Because this is what a lot of people are reading if they, if they Google uh, the Muslim Association and is with Gaza Hospital bombing. Well, uh, you know, one of the, like one of the things I would look at uh, is look at who is the, is the the service provider, the digital platform for their website, because there is going to be terms of service, and uh, the uh, term, terms of service. Uh, May, may well prohibit what they're doing. Report it. Uh, like, you know, how many people here know what the platform is for the Asper Jewish Community Center? It's Akamai. Uh, and, and they've got terms of service about improper use, illicit use. Uh, and, and if the Rady Jewish Community Center was doing something wrong on their website, you could go to Akamai and complain to them about it. Uh, and, and, and there is a, uh, it's a free internet service for any website. You put in the URL, the Universal Resource Locator, and, and you can find out what the, the, the platform is for that website. And you can go to the website of the platform and you can get the terms of service. And, and, uh, and you can complain to them about violation of the terms of service. And if they agree, They'll cut it. Uh, they'll they'll take off the content. They'll they'll, they'll they'll say you've broken the contract and kick you off the internet, or kick you off That's their awesome. platform, anyways. Uh, so look at that. And if they don't agree? Well, if they if they, if they don't agree, uh, that's a problem, of course, because uh, the they're. I mean, this is a, a, this is what I was saying that they're not. They're basically uh, not subject to laws right now, and they should be. But at least, it's, it's not as if you have no recourse in it. You don't have to go to the people who posted it to get to them to change their mind. You can go to somebody who's independent and, and cares more about their business than they do about the, that particular posting. Can you take that question here? I have a question that CBC yes. is one-sided the whole time during the whole conflict, or in, 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 uh, in general, very anti-Semitic um, and hateful. Everything that they present is completely wrong. Yet, we are, they're funded by the public. It's from our taxpayer that we all pay and goes, and you don't do anything about it. Why? Well, uh, I mean, I even with CBC, there, there is an internal complaint system. They, they have an uh, yeah. uh, ombudsman and... Uh, 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 it's... It's not a, a yeah. It's not ideal, but it, it's worth invoking, and, and uh, it's 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 worth trying. What about class action and asking for our money back? Because we don't want our money to go to them. <laughs> well, you know, I'd I'd like to pay tax my taxes to go just to the parts of the government I like, but uh, <laughs> unfortunately, this tax system doesn't work that way. But uh, as I say, I, you know, I, I think it's worthwhile to invoke the complaint system. I may not do, get the, the it's, it's better than nothing, better than just complaining. Vote conservative. Yeah. Okay, um, so like I said, if you have more questions, and I'm sure some of you do, um, you, can e you can email me and I can forward it to David and maybe he could help us uh, understand things better. Um, I'd like to thank David and Leah. I'm sorry I didn't have water for you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ashamed to take my